Good evening and welcome to today's session on BIC streams. Policy craft, what looms ahead? How do multiple stakeholders' voices resonate in the handloom and handicraft sector? Joining us today are our panelists Ashok Chatterjee, Archana Shah, Lala Tabji, Michael Pinto, and Sadhana Rao. The duration of today's session is 80 minutes. We will have 20 minutes for Q&A at the end of the discussion. Before I hand over to Sadhana, uh, for those of you who are here for the first time and want to receive updates from us, you can do so by visiting our website or you can follow us on our social media channels, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, with that, welcome everyone and over to you Sadhana. Thank you Raghu. A very warm welcome to the panelists and speakers. A very warm welcome to the members of the audience. Welcome to this session at the BIC. Wish it could be live in the auditorium as opposed to us being on Zoom, but we'll get there. Thank you. The Indian handloom and handicraft sector, along with its million weavers, artisans, craftsmen, with their creativity and thinking hands, as I would say, have given India its distinctive culture, aesthetic identity. And our four very distinguished panelists have spent and invested time in this very arena. Truly, they really need no introduction, but just to build context to the session, policy craft, what looms ahead, I'll briefly illuminate their contribution. Laila Tayyabji, founder member, and chairperson of Dastakar, a society for crafts and craftspeople, has spent over 40 years with myriad craftsmen, craftspeople, and artisans pan India. Professor Ashok Chatterjee, former director of the National Institute of Design, former president of the Crafts Council of India, where he, an entity where he continues to advise, is an important voice of knowledge in this sector. Mr. Michael Pinto, an officer of the Indian Administrative Services, who's held important boards in this sector. He was the chairman of the Handicraft and Handloom Export Corporation of India, chairman of Central Cottage Industries Corporation of India, additional director, Handlooms Government of India, Archana Shah of Founder Bandej, an enterprise built to preserve uphold the values of artisans, skill, knowledge, and the handmade. With that, we officially open this session. I now invite our panelists to speak for five minutes each on their specific areas of work. The current middle ground that we stand in the existing scenario where we have the dispensation of disbanding of the All India Handloom Board and the All India Handicraft Board with the official policy of minimum government and maximum, gov maximum governance. Uh, we could take this alphabetically, Professor Ashok Chatterjee or Archana, followed by Laila, and then on to Mike. Michael. Why not Archana go first? <laughs> uh, I kept quiet because I didn't know the student and the teacher, so uh, I give leave the choice to you. So, do I think? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Chatterjee, I yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, as um, as Adha mentioned, I've been working in this um, the hand crafted textile sector for the last 40 years. And um, I believe very strongly that if there is work for the artisan, um, they will continue to practice their craft. We have the largest repository of hand skills in the world. Handcrafted textiles is our living heritage. Each region offers its own unique skills motives, color palettes, raw materials and techniques. Reviving the handcrafted sector can help transform lives in rural India. Apart from the beauty and heritage value, 
It has the potential of creating millions of jobs without huge investment, which would benefit almost 30 million people presently involved in the sector. It can help empower women and marginalized communities involved in the sector, giving them a sense of meaning, self-worth and dignity. It can help provide sustained livelihoods to, and protect people from forced migration to cities where jobs are hard to find and living conditions are brutal. Most people, if they have work within their, within their native regions, would, not, would prefer to not migrate um, to cities. Handcrafted sector is an eco-friendly means of production. It has a light carbon footprint and addresses <clears throat> issues related to climate change and fulfills most of uh, most of the it fulfills most of the United Nations sustainability development goals. Instead of dismantling the institutions, we need a network of institutions that would help revive, rejuvenate the craft sector and, and transform lives in rural India. Okay. You, could, you still have more time? <laughs> well, I think there are, there are many, many policy, I mean, more than words, such as handloom day or global to local, what we really need is concrete policies um, with a very clear vision uh, and an action plan that would create a real impact. You see, at the moment you don't, I mean, just having a hand day will not help and has not helped because these, these statements you, you do not reflect in any change in, in the lives of artisans around the country. So I think what we really need is very, very strong policies. But even that, so that is why you need a network of institutions that would help um, revive the sector. All right. So that's about, yes, we could move to Professor Ashok Chatterjee. Thank you. Well, I think, um... We've just heard why this sector is important, and I don't want to repeat that. But I think that we are having this discussion in the context of uh, a development, which is the closing of these two boards, which is probably symptomatic of a much larger malaise, which is that despite all the reasons that Archana mentioned, this sector is the victim of colossal neglect. And the COVID pandemic is just the latest in a whole series of uh, blows which artisans have faced. Uh, demonetization was a crippling blow, which came at a time when sales should have been at their peak. Just as they were recovering or trying to recover from that, there was the uh, nightmare of GST uh, compliance from an industry which is largely rural based. If that was not enough, we had uh, natural disasters in places like, like Kerala, the Northeast. There was a lockdown in Jammu and Kashmir, so one of the richest craft areas was, has been cut off from its sources of, of income and from its markets one after the other. And then came COVID, which none of us could have anticipated. So one has to understand that this sector has been in an extremely difficult situation for a while before this happened, before COVID happened. What is symbolic about the closing of these two boards, both of which I think everybody agrees have been moribund and less than functional for years is the fact that they still represented 
the only space, and I repeat, only space in which the artisans had a voice, at least on paper. Now, just a couple of days ago, you had a, uh, a webinar or lecture at, at the center on Riten Mozumdar. You might remember in what was shown some of the landmark work that took place under these boards with the help of the government of India at a critical time in India's craft history and design history. The amazing work that people like Ritin Mazumdar and uh, K. N. Subraman, K. G. Subramaniam and others did under the auspices of, of the boards. No. So when one talks about the boards being non-functional, one has to understand that that is part of their history, but is not the whole history. The boards also established the Handicraft and Handloom Export Corporation, which ran the fabulous Sona shops. And I remember that from the time that I was working in the United States, what a catalyst the, the Sona shop in New York was for understanding of India and in fact for diplomacy. It was a place where the whole world came in a small shop to meet together in a celebration not only of craft, but of India. So there has been a long period where these boards have not served any purpose, but the reasons given for their closing are very difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. Because we just heard, and we, I'm sure we will also hear, of the great and urgent need for policies and supports that the sector needs in the face of what has uh, been an extremely difficult spell of several years of one disaster after the other for the Indian artisans. Now, with the uh, COVID situation, what was really required at this point was a signal from the government of India that these millions of artisans, uh, we heard just now a figure of 30 million, that's an estimate for the handloom sector of total employment, but for the sector as a whole, handmade sector, it is much, much more. We don't know how many more, because such is the neglect of the sector that the accurate data does not exist. But the estimates range from the official of uh, approximately 11 million to as many as 250 million. So if you understand the scale of what we are talking about, we talk about this as the second largest source of Indian livelihood after agriculture. The second largest source of livelihood after Indian agriculture requires something more than a three line dismissal in a Gazette notification. If the boards were non-functional, the responsibility for that is entirely the government of India because the boards are under the chair of the Ministry of, of Textiles. Every appointment is made by them, not by anyone else. And so we've heard about this need for uh, maximum uh, governance and minimal government. But in the COVID situation, are we saying that's the way ahead for India? Are we saying that the government has to step out? In all aspects of the COVID pandemic, the government's role is central. And if the, there are institutions that need to be reformed, perhaps even junked if necessary, surely there should be something to tell us what will take their place. And what is really disturbing is that the phones have not stopped ringing since this abrupt announcement was made. And the calls are coming in from whom? They're coming in from artisans all over this country, asking whether what they have heard is true. What does it mean? We are hearing about suicides again in Andhra Pradesh and in Telangana. We had heard this earlier. Many of those million migrants who were on the roads recently were artisans. We need to make sure that there are non-farm livelihoods available to them in their places of, of residence and work. 
as has been pointed out by Archana, we need jobs where people are located. And there is no industry in the country that can respond to non-farm employment opportunities in rural areas with the power and of the scale as of the hand sector. And that, in order to make that a reality, we're going to need to get together, all of us, government and non-government, in a collaborative, collegial environment in order to help our artisans take us into, hopefully, a future a slightly brighter than what we are now facing. Thank you. Laila, over to you. Thank you. Five minutes. Yes, of course. You know, crafts is so important and handlooms are so important. But more important than that are the people who make them. And this is where I feel everything goes wrong. Because, uh, as Ashok said, uh, the AIHB boards were a forum, admittedly a very weak forum in the last so many years. And I'm speaking with the figures, they say that they met six times in 11 years. Well, that obviously includes previous governments as well. I think those of us who've critiqued this judgment are often seen as bashing the present government, but far from it. Uh, we have been, both Ashok and I, have been very vocal voices in saying that the neglect of this sector is absolutely deplorable. I think both Archana and Ashok have spoken very eloquently about why this sector is important. But somewhere in all this, uh, you know, craft becomes put in a little box of culture and aesthetic. And it's brought out when, you know, foreign dignitaries come or we want to do a nice presentation on India or whatever. But we really forget the people behind the product and their stories and their needs. And one of the words which I find most frustrating whenever I talk about uh, craftspeople is that we are always told that, oh, craftspeople are so resilient. So really, when I question why this sector is, again, to repeat what has been said, the second largest sector of employment in the country, why it doesn't get that kind of investment that other sectors do, why it is always somehow at the moment in this COVID situation, neither fitting into MSME relief schemes, nor into Manrega schemes, so that they're absolutely sort of on their own. Uh, and we always told that Oh, well, you know, craftspeople people have always been there. They've been there for, you know, 5,000 years. They're there. It's wonderful. Why do they need it? And I think that this is so short-sighted because actually the craft sector is a gold mine. Again, as, I show, uh, as Archana said, we have this amazing range of techniques, materials, motives, a design directory, which is unparalleled in the world. And we have in every corner of India, we have a, a completely different ways of treating fabric, of treating metal, of treating wood, of treating uh, terracotta. We have everything from craftspeople who make temples to craftspeople who can write the Gita on a piece of rice. You know, I mean, the range is just phenomenal. So one would be thinking that in a time when India is trying to catch up with the rest of the world, in so many other things that we would say, this is our gold mine. We should be investing in it. We should take it. The Chinese who are so savvy have been coming to India for years and taking Indian craftspeople and teaching them, you know, getting them to teach Chinese how to weave kanjivaram saris, how to make bangle, glass bangles, how to make kolapuri chappals, how to do chicken work embroidery. And all over the world in markets, you see all this stuff, which from say about 500 yards, looks as if it's from India, and then you go a little closer and you see it's a very poor imitation, but it's because people in South Asia, and this includes countries like the Philippines, like Indonesia, like Thailand, like Cambodia, have realized that their strength is in having something that other countries can't do as well. And so we should actually be making the most of this. I think we, I don't know whether we are complacent or we are just so 
you know, used to craftspeople and having crafts, that we don't really realize what an asset is, it is. Of course, again, as Ashok said, it's a wonderful way to create rural employment uh, because once again, it prevents migration, it prevents uh, displacement of social patterns and uh, cultural mores, but it also gives employment to women. I mean, the, in my uh, 45 years now working in the craft sector, many things really haven't changed too much for craftspeople. But a huge change is the numbers of women coming into the sector, people who practice various crafts for themselves, for their families, but never thought of it as a way of earning. And the amazing catalyst it's been to their well-being, to the well-being of the families, to their own self-worth, their place in the community. And I mean, we should be promoting this. But I think that we just have to do so much more because craftspeople are leaving the sector in droves and COVID has just added to that. They feel that where can we go now, you know, and what is going to happen and is there any alternative? Luckily, there's a little hiatus because there are no other economic opportunities at the moment. There's huge unemployment in India. So we have to persuade craftspeople to stay where they are and do what they know how to do so well. But we have to make it something that is worth their while. I'm not just talking about the economics. Some craftspeople now are earning much better than they did when I started 45 years ago. But I'm really talking about the social position status of craftspeople. No one treats a craftsperson as a professional. They are skilled professionals. To lay an ikat warp is actually much more complex than doing software programming. But is this something that anyone recognizes? Not at all. You know, they are considered, I mean, you have to be a mathematician, you have to be a designer, you have to be an artist, and you have to be very dexterous with your hands. It's an extraordinary skill, but no, this is something that, oh, it's always been there. It's not something worth doing. Unless we can give craftspeople a sense that they are worthwhile and that we value them and we consider them an intrinsic part of the professional classes of India, I don't think the younger generation is going to continue in this whole theme. To go back, I presume we are discussing the issue of the All India Handicrafts Boards a little later. But I just want to use it as an absolute paradigm of the whole way that we don't think it's worthwhile listening to the voices of the people who actually are doing the things. I mean, the All India Handicrafts Boards, what inspirational work they used to do. Every institution that we now think of as handicrafts, including the handicrafts boards themselves, was the result of those early meetings of Kamla Devi and Pupul Jaikar and Elsie Jain and so many others nurturing and encouraging and seeing where the skills of India could be best used. The cottage emporiums, those wonderful Vishwa Karma, I'm coming to an end, Vishwa Karma exhibitions, the, the uh, Sona shops, all those things, the state handicaps boards were part of those meetings. We need to have a forum like that, and I'm really, really passionate about it. Thank you, Laila. We will come back to some of the issues raised with you by you. Uh, Mr. Michael, if I can have your um, speak now. Um, in fact, uh, I'm going to say really that a lot of what I wanted to say has already been said, and uh, there's so little left to say. But beware the person who starts out by saying that he, all that he wanted to say has been said already and that he has nothing left to say. He will then spend the next 25 minutes doing precisely what he said there's no reason to do. Namely, saying all those things over again. You have four minutes. <laughs> I don't propose to do anything different this time. Uh, let me start out by saying that it is, should be taken for granted that this uh, hand, handloom and handicraft sectors are really treasures. They're really something of the cultural heritage of which this country should be really proud. And there should be no way by which they are threatened in any manner. 
their potential for providing employment, their potential for giving employment where it is most needed, their, their potential for uh, helping the agriculture sector by getting off-farm employment, their potential for ensuring that you don't have a great mass movement and a migration that could cause so much problem, all that is take, should be taken for granted. There's no question about it. There's one more thing, there's one more thing, and I think Laila touched on it, and that is the amazing effect it has on the position of women. I don't know if Laila Tayabji remembers this, but it was folklore with us at a time that I used to work with the handroom and handicraft sector. It was, a, uh, it was the, the time of shortage and scarcity in Gujarat. There was near famine conditions in Gujarat. Agriculture had taken a toss, the monsoon had failed, people were not able to find livelihood in the agriculture sector. And Laila Tayabji and Jaya Jaitri opened a system, a place where craftspersons would come. They would be given work, they would be told what to do, they would prepare it and then come back and they would be paid wages for it. This was of immense help at a time when there was a major scarcity. The story was that at the beginning, the craftspersons would come, the wife and the husband with a baby. The wife would be the one who was doing the work, but she would be in the background. The husband would come striding forward and say, yes, what is it? And then these ladies would say, no, we want to talk to the craftsman. No, 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 talk to me, I'll tell her. And they said, no, we want to talk to her. And finally, she would come hesitantly and they would explain it to her. And then she would go back again, carrying the baby, walking three steps behind. But by the time the project ended four weeks later, it was the woman craftsperson who would stride confidently ahead, give the craft offering to the, uh, to the people concerned and take the wages. The man would be carrying the baby at the back. Now, this, I think, is something that we have to keep in mind the amazing effect it has on the status of women. This is something that we really need to look at. I have been looking at some of the reactions to the scrapping of the, of the two boards. And it has ranged from saying, well, it's not that big a deal, to saying it's the death knell of the, of the sector. Now, I can think of several other decisions that have been taken by government that could far better qualify to be described as the death knell of this sector. I don't think the scrapping of these boards is the death knell of the sector. But to understand why, we need to go back a little bit. We need to look at the first board that was set up, the handloom board, was, the handicraft board was set up by Pupul Jaikar in 1952, and the handloom board followed later. And at that time, they were, these were the real pioneers. These were the doughty women who actually started it and made sure that it, it kept on. And the people involved were genuine crafts people and those who were interested in crafts. Has that situation continued? If you look at the last handicraft board, it had, I think, something like 113 people. Of them, 112, 113, something like that. 128, actually, including the official. 140. No, no. 140. 114, I think. 114. Of that, something like 33, 34 were government, semi government people. Now, look, this board is supposed to be advising the government. And government people on that board constitute something like 30%. So government is really listening to its own advice. I think there is a time for changing that. We need to make sure that people who are there are people who can genuinely give advice. Look at the other people. And as Laila said, I'm not talking about the present government. I'm talking about this from a, at least the last 30 to 40 years. The Janata government came to power on the premise of doing a great deal to help handrooms and handicrafts. The first chairman of the handloom board that they appointed was a person who had never seen a loom in his life. But he had to be accommodated because they owed him. It was a political debt that they were pay paying. Now, I think very much the same thing is, is happening right throughout today. In fact, at that time, the number of persons who were appointed on the handloom board who had no connection at all with handlooms was legion. They were many of the people, people were those who had leapt across the wall as soon as the last government had fallen and had come to join the new government. And they were rewarded at different times. In 1980, they made the return journey back and got rewarded again in the old place. Now, the point is that if you have a whole lot of people who have lost the original uh, the, the mojo, have lost the original initiative and the determination that, that was there, uh, the ambition that was there, then you're going to get a situation where the advice that you get is, is tainted. Now, uh, if you look at it, at that time, people have already mentioned it. The immense task that was done by these ladies, Mupul Jaikar and uh, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay, L.C. Jain and others, in setting up things that really mattered. So you had the uh, cottage industries emporium. 
But you also had the handloom houses. Fabric, fabric society put up handloom houses everywhere. You also had beautiful crafts areas, the Mysore Crafts Palace. State governments had Quaptex in Tamil Nadu, Aptex in Andhra, and the corresponding things in, in uh, West Bengal, in UP, and in Kerala. All states had this. So this was the initiative taken up in the beginning by the handloom board and the handicraft board. Unfortunately, this has not changed. If you look at it now, who, who does the agenda for the handloom board? Whenever the handloom and the handicraft board meet, the agenda is fixed by government. Government then writes the agenda notes. People come and discuss what government tells them to discuss. The, uh, the, the, the minutes of the meeting are prepared by government. So the conclusions are what government lays down. If this is so, can we really say that they are giving advice to government that should be heeded? Are they really qualified to do this? I would like to use this as an opportunity to get an alternative institutional mechanism in there. I don't think the handloom and handicraft boards are going to work anymore. I think what we need is a, a, an alternative. I would like to see the, the Archana Shahs of this world, the Laila Tabjis of this world, the Jaya Jetlis of this world, the Gita Rams of this world, other designers, the, 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 the followers of Mata and Singh and others. I would like to see them constitute a small pressure group, a small group. And these would be aided by people who with financial background, with management background, people who are designers, people who are textile technologists, because it is these people that will add strength and color to this board. Look at it. At one time, we were a basket case for milk. Today, we are the world's largest producers of milk. Was this done by a dairy board? Many people would say it was done in spite of a dairy board. If you look at the, the, the Institute for Rural Development, was it as a result of a development board for rural, for rural areas? No, it was other things. So I think we can do something more. And I would really plead for the starting of a different kind of organization now that will be staffed not by government, but by people who set up this group themselves. They should then ask for an opportunity to interact with government. I would suggest to begin with at least three times a year. I would like it to be oftener, but let's start with three times a year. And when they meet, don't meet with the minister. Meet with the Development Commissioner Handlooms and the hand, and Handicrafts. Meet with the Secretary Textiles and Joint Secretaries. Have that kind of meeting and draw up the agenda by this group. Nobody else should draw it up. The conclusion should be kept with, by, should be drawn by this group. And then they could take it up again with government finding out, is there some way by which we can implement it? There could be an, uh, a point of view about finance for this. Yes, but I think COVID has shown us that we can do a whole lot of work on uh, on the net, on Zoom, on other things like that. So maybe that's the way to see it. Let's look at this as an opportunity. Let's look at it as a chance to go forward in an entirely new situation and a new milieu and something that I hope will answer the needs of the sectors. Well, that was a very powerful summation from all the speakers. And if I were to abstract words and create a word cloud, I think we would have the textbook for policy right away. But uh, shifting gears, while we've, while we've all accepted that the segment is very important, the sector is very important, is there a debate that we have shied away from, which is the economic landscape? Now, I do understand that in the arts, the ecosystems in the arts and connecting it to economics is like really looking for patterns in stormy seas uh, and it's that difficult. There has been a data issue. So I want to draw the panelists to give us one or two suggestions that are rooted in the economics. We'll come to exports briefly. We'll touch upon exports, uh, Mr. Pinto. But how do we change the economic landscape? As there is, it is an issue of livelihoods. We have about, in the next 20 minutes, if we can deliberate on one or two suggestions to formulate a mechanism to elevate the economic landscape, and then we could uh, take what should be the directional compass of the ideal policy before we open it to Q&A. Professor Chatterjee, you've spent a little time on the economic profiling of the landscape. Would you like to go first? Oh, a little time is putting it mildly. <laughs> well over a decade. Uh, more than 10 years ago, we were informed at the highest levels of decision making in this country that there was no future for craft. The term that was used was that this is a sunset industry. 
an industry that should be left to vanish into the into the night and that we should be encouraging we were actually told this we should be encouraging artisans to go into information technology uh, after this extraordinary phrase was used we realized that we had to do some introspection here how is it possible that in the land of Tagore, Gandhi, uh, Kamla Devi, Pupul Jaikar, L.C. Jain, and all the other greats, how could it possibly be that we had come to this pass where crafts would be declared a sunset industry? A couple, uh, a couple day, a couple years later, some of us happened to be in China, and for the World Crafts Council meeting, and the dignitary. <laughs> From Beijing to open this International Conference on Crafts said that in 2004, China had identified two industries as absolutely essential to its global economic power. And I underline the word economic. And he said these, these industries were crafts and information technology. Some of us ran to the translation booth because the gentleman had said, these are China's sunrise industries. And we wanted to make absolutely sure we had understood it correctly. The long and the short of this is that part of this is the fault of us who have been working in this sector. We have not taken the economics of this seriously. We have not had economists on our teams. Elsie Jern was one of the exceptions. But with all the great work that was done, the economics was ignored and therefore investment was ignored. Now what has to be done, and this is what we've it's been taking us 10 years and we still haven't reached it. We have been trying to work with the government of India on one point agenda, which is to get the data for this sector. It is completely unacceptable that a country which is host the largest, uh, the largest, um, what, what I call the holds the largest resource of craft, wisdom, and skill in the world should not know how many people are affected. To have data which ranges from 11 to 250 million is a matter of shame. But that is the situation now. The official data that on which investments are made is absolutely wrong. And it is wrong even by government's own uh, admission and findings. So we are still working on that because unless we have the data right, how are you going to get investments in? Who is going to invest in an industry which hasn't got the data to back up its claims? And that is an extremely important and difficult area which we are still working on. And as soon as COVID is closed, the battle will continue for reliable, a foundation of reliable data on the sector without which its economics cannot be understood. It doesn't rest with just that data, the kind of issues that Mr. Pinto raised of women, the problem of wages, what constitutes a fair wage, intellectual property rights. There's a whole range of economic related issues. And at the heart of this is building strong marketing systems, which can actually link the consumer with the artisan. Archana, if I could bring you in. How has the private-public interface been for you? I don't understand what you mean by... Um... No, given Bandej is a private enterprise mm -hmm. and you're dealing at the public level, what has the interface been for you in terms of economics? <laughs> I, don't, I don't sort of see it. I, I find that you need to create strong marketing uh, platform for craft. And I think in some ways, to our interaction with or our collaborations with artisans. Um, it's a drop in the ocean, but I've been able to showcase that over the last 40 years, we've been able to consistently work with groups of artisans and provide work through these collaborations. So beyond Bandej, I think what the craft sector really, really needs today is a dynamic uh, marketing platform, multiple levels of marketing platform. Um, supported by a very, very strong vision where 
the people making those decisions or 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 supporting um, policy should be the stakeholders themselves because their voices are exceedingly important. Very often, craftspeople know what they need to do to 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 change their lives, and people uh, and very often this is not taken into consideration, and that is why um, there's a lot of wastage and and the right policies are not made. So people who work at the ground le level who collaborate on a regular basis with artisans and the artisans themselves should really be um, involved. Very often I've heard from artisans saying things like, Ye AC babu kya um, and I, I think this, this, it's telling in many ways because policies are made that don't make meaning or, or, or for, the, for, for the artisans, you see? So, I think these, th this is an exceedingly important issue. Uh, once there are markets, they would be obviously, the market will demand appropriate product. So, so the whole net system would start functioning. Where, of course, you need designers. You need a whole range of things. You need to create, to begin with, you need to create awareness and appreciation for handcrafted textiles. Once this is the plat marketing platform is there, there is awareness, there is a demand from the market. We have the skills, we have the artisans who can produce, produce the product. So I think it's a whole vicious circle that has to really work well. So Mr. Pinto, if I could just segue from what Archana and Professor Chatterjee said, that you helped the Handloom and the Handicraft Export Corporation. They were built on revenue models and market accessibilities. Currently, if I go with the approximation of exports, it's at $850 million. That's probably a statistic that is very transparently, it at least comes up. So is that a base or a peak? Because... Because? No, go ahead. No, I was going to say that it's difficult to say whether it's a base or a peak. Actually, the amount that you export is a function of the markets elsewhere, a function of how clever you are at exporting, a function of the design input and design, a function of the financial input. All these together constituted. Rather than look only at export, I would like to look at the total uh, scenario for selling handloom and handry handicraft products, both within the country and outside. Sure. We need to have a system in which we encourage more and more people to invest in this. Now, typically when we do this in government, they say, okay, put 500 crore on the table there and let them use it. So we throw money at a problem and expect that it will disappear. Alas for our naivety, it doesn't work that way. Very often that money is, is wasted. We've spent so much on rebate in the handloom sector. If a rebate is the answer to it, then the handloom sector would have gone places up by now. Clearly it isn't. And rebate as, a, as an economic tool seems to be an, a, in a, a belief or an assumption that the handloom sector is prima facie uneconomical, unviable, something that really needs support all the time. And if it does need support, then I think it would be difficult to envisage a total uh, support to this, this industry for all time to come. That is not what it is. There are handloom products that have a very good market that need to be uh, pr pr produced, that need to be pushed, but it needs to have people who understand it. It needs to have people who will invest and who could be encouraged to invest by being maybe giving them some tax breaks on it. Is there some way by which you can do that? That is one way of encouraging investment. But the sector needs investment. It needs to make sure that hang yarn is available to the handloom sector. It needs to make sure that wool is available to the carpet sector. It needs to make sure that other inputs are available at a reasonable prices, that there is enough finance to purchase them. These are the things that we need to be doing. And that's why I said that instead of having a great big board, have a small group of people who will then work on these things and discuss them with government to take them forward. I believe that the way forward has to be this way. It cannot be in the sense of, let's have a budget provision of 500 crores or something like that. I was reading again something, and I, I noted it down actually, where uh, there was a demand from people that uh, they, because of the, of the crisis that we now have, COVID and this and that and the other, we need 5,000 crore for free dhoti and sadi, 23 BPL families, 23 lakh BP uh, families. We need NABAD refinance to revive the sector. We need 500 crore to compensate for wage loss. 2,000 crore to procure accumulator handrooms. Uh, there's a whole lot of other things. The point I'm trying to make is that even if all these are granted, 
the numbers are finite. After you've finished your 5,000 crore, then what happens? Has the problem been solved? No, it hasn't. So we need to look at it in a more systematic fashion. Encourage investment, encourage investment by possibly giving tax breaks, but no other things, no saying rebate, no saying we'll give you concessions here or concessions there. At most, a tax break could be considered if the majority or the, say, 80 or 90 percent of your turnover is from handloom and handicraft. Maybe that could be about. Your thoughts, Leila? Well, I want to go at it from two angles, and I think both of them will be more personalized because I think we've got the larger picture. But, uh, you know, you asked about the whole market and things. Obviously, craft people are struggling for marketing. But on the other hand, there are some very reassuring figures which show that um, people do want handicrafts. People do want handloom and are extraordinary textiles. There is an instinct, even in a sort of a person who wears blue jeans, still wants to wear something crafted on the top, maybe a bandhani top, maybe a mirror work bag or whatever. And I think that uh, the most reassuring figure out of these many very difficult to comprehend figures is that there's a very sad one, which says that about 15% of India's craftspeople leave the sector every 10 years or so. And that is, I think, uh, increasing very rapidly as the younger generation don't find it an attractive option. But on the other hand, the sale of handicrafts has, is really still rising. And apart from a little blip when India first uh, sort of globalized and liberalized and all these fancy brands came into the country, this has steadily risen. Oh the amount the sales. And I can give you the instance of Daskar itself or many of our small Daskar groups. Daskar is a tiny NGO. We don't get funding from anybody. We don't use government schemes anymore either. We are a handful of about 10, 12 people. But uh, we have a space in Delhi which is quite far out. Everybody complains about it. It's open air, it's whatever. But we managed to generate in 10 days about four or five crores worth of sales because people of all ages, all kinds, still feel that it's worth to make that 45 minute or 55 minute journey there and come and shop because it's something that they respond to. But so there is a demand. There is a feeling, there's a market. I'm not even talking about the international market, which is very variable and speculative. And we really don't know what's going to happen post COVID. But in India itself, there still is that feeling at all levels of society that they would like to buy handloom and handicraft if it was available to them and accessible. Now, craftspeople also would actually like to supply the consumers who want their crafts. But in order to do this successfully, they need access to credit, they need access to raw, the appropriate raw materials, they need uh, access to R&D, they need access to good design and product development. And so if you're giving craftspeople money, they should be institutions and individuals who can support them to give them this appropriately. Again, in Daskar, uh, when COVID struck and it was very obvious that craftspeople were going to be left out of whatever relief packages were there, we set up an artisan support fund. We raised, I think, something like about 49 lakhs. And we have distributed that first for food and sort of hygiene products and then for raw materials and wages for their production. And, you know, we have touched about, I think, 3,000 plus families of artisans across India. And the amounts that we're giving are really, you know, maybe 25,000 to maximum 55,000. But it has enabled them to buy raw material, to start production again, and to also, you know, start developing products which they can launch in the market either by e-portals 
or when the market reopens again. So the amount of money that the sector requires is not huge because they have raw materials which are usually accessible locally. They have the skill is in their hands. It doesn't use infrastructure. It doesn't use power and technology to that extent. So you can restart it quite fast. And the fact is that there are millions of hands and millions of creative minds who want to be brought into this and made part of India's mainstream economy. We have to think of innovative ways to do it and not say that, oh, this is a primitive thing which we have to subsidize and support until they can be brought into the sort of technological mainstream. I think that's the mistake that we make. We don't look upon these people as drivers of the Indian economy. We're just looking at them as something which has to be kept going until they somehow miraculously disappear and become, I don't know what. So I think I'm quite optimistic about what could happen to the craft sector, because as I said, and everyone has said, we have this diversity of extraordinary skills and we have the capacity to increase it both for domestically and otherwise. And we have a consumer demand, but somehow we have to make this come together and give them what they need. I remember going to a, a bank manager in Dharwar Hubli some years ago when the banks had been instructed that they had to give loans. And I was trying to get uh, this young uh, sort of Irical weaver alone because he got an order and he wanted some money to buy the yarn. And the bank manager said, uh, so what do you make? And he said, I make these Irical saris. And this chap laughed and he said, oh, you know, my grandmother used to wear, wear these saris. Who will want them? Why don't you start a matchbox factory? So if we have, if the people who are actually in the position to give credit and support to artisans have this kind of mentality, whether it's a bureaucrat saying sunset industry or bank manager saying no one wants to buy grandmother's saris, you are going to have a situation where the chap will leave the sector. And this is why actually the figures are so small because craftspeople, crafts communities have the capacity to make things in crores but they don't have the money to invest in making that stock. And so they're selling little, little bits. Well, thank you for your thoughts. Uh, we have about five minutes before we open it to Q&A. So away from economics, away from policy craft, there's a question that I'd like to ask each of the panelists. What has been the role of a visionary in this sector? We've had Kamla Devi Chattopadhyaya, we've had Mahatma Gandhi. You know, there is a role that, a, you know, it's away from politics, away from economics, away from craft. Is it relevant to have a visionary? Can I answer that? Sure. Yeah. I want to say that the visionary has a very important role, but given the Indian temperament, we are only too ready to let a visionary lead and not to follow, you know? We all say, yes, yes, brilliant. But then we don't use those as an example to mold ourselves in that thing and to take. We tend to be very passive. India produces extraordinary visionaries, but we don't have enough you know, activists who take on that role. And I think that's what's very important. Sure, Professor Chatterjee. I think that's a good question. And as Laila just mentioned, please don't put the burden on so-called visionaries. Some years ago, my colleagues and I in the Crafts Council went to Vishwabharati, and Archana was with us, to actually explore what Tagore went through. And it's amazing that he felt that nobody in his institution actually understood what he was doing. And he wrote to Gandhiji, saying that I'm coming to the end of my life, and nobody understands what I'm doing. So when I drop dead, will you take over? my work at Vishwa Bharati. And Gandhiji wrote back to him and saying, my dear fellow, firstly, I spent half my time in jail, so how will I be of use to you? Secondly, I'm writing, you, writing to you from Vardha, 
nobody cares and understands what I'm doing here. So let's just soldier on. And keep in mind that Tagore had a terrible time uh, trying to get his colleagues to understand the craft sector. So much so that much of the work was actually closed down uh, when he passed away. And his son, who was leading that work, went into exile into, the, into Derudun. Gandhiji left behind the Gandhi institutions. But the Gandhi institutions had no uh, hesitation to do what Mr. Pinto has just told us, to say, buy Khadi during rebate week. Buy it at, at a discount. The world's greatest fabric during my childhood was bought by our family only during rebate and uh, discount times. What kind of an image were we giving the greatest products that our hands are capable of making? So I think he's absolutely correct that we need to reimagine this issue. And the visionaries are there, the young people, the ones that Lila was talking about, who believe in sustainable, a sustainable planet, who believe in a just society. They are the ones who will carry this industry further. And they are the ones out of whom you will get visionaries. And there have been uh, young visionaries coming out of them. Let me also just add that at the foundation of all of this, there has to be a demand for handmade quality. Mr. Pinto touched on this. There has to be a demand. People have to be willing to pay for handmade quality. And the interesting thing to note in terms of the statistics that are available is that the only reliable statistics that we have are on export, right? And if you look at the export statistics, you will be struck by one fact, that even at the time of global recession, cycles of global recession, there has been no fall in the overseas demand for Indian handicrafts. The graph keeps climbing, maybe not at the same rate, but it keeps climbing. So what does that tell us? And that's what we don't seem to have understood. But keep also in mind that exports are the icing on the cake. They are not the cake. The cake is the domestic market. And that's what we really have to understand and build that demand, create the demand, which really means reaching out to the next generation and making sure that they understand the relevance of India's handlooms to looking after this country, looking after each other, and looking after the planet which shelters us all. And looking wonderful. Well, with that, I think the anthem is Soldier On. And I will have now thank you for being a brilliant panel, for being a very lively and engaging panel. Uh, I will hand you over to Lag Raghu. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I, I'd like to start with uh, Mayank's question. Uh, what has prevented us from making radical and disruptive policies? Is it directed at anybody in particular? No. Yeah. No, it, it's it's to all of our panelists. Would you just repeat the question, Raghu? Yeah, yeah, that, you know, um, that the need of the hour is radical change. And what has prevented us from making radical and disruptive policies or thinking about radical and disruptive policies? Archana? I think to begin with, you have raise your hand. No. Okay. I think we need to first care for the sector you know, spread awareness for the sector. So only then will you make, there are lots of things that statements made like the handloom day and whatever else, but um, just a policy or just statements, you know, actually you need to, it has, it has to be a much more comprehensive plan so that there is a real impact in the sector. And I think there's a lot to learn. I mean, if, this time, I, you know, something like the Bari Jori Heart to me is one great example in, in, in uh, Orissa. Orissa is one state where 80%, it's, it's a state which has a lot of handlooms and 80% of the handlooms get utilized within the state. The weavers themselves have had this every Friday morning in Western uh, Orissa where they have this heart. Weavers come and directly sell to 
local people and local traders by the end of the morning in the first four or five hours they do a sale of over a lakh and a, a crore and a half on good days they've reached two and a half crores there is no government intervention here there, but there is i'm just i what i would like to say is there is a lot to learn from what we already have we need to build on this um traditional wisdom traditional ways of doing things use modern technology modern understanding uh, to help transform the sector so i mean policy there have been there have been no concrete policies things have been fluctuating um policies are made withdrawn this we we need a clear we need a political will and a, a very strong passionate vision to make a huge difference so before the radical policy let's take care of the sector yes mr pinto yeah i was just saying that uh, uh, the question seemed to be uh, why are radical decisions difficult to come to why are radical policies not being implemented well i think because radicalism like revolutionaries are difficult it's much easier to go along the beaten path so every time you have a problem the tendency among us especially among policy makers in india i find is to throw money at it so the demands also are for that i read out to you some of the demands we want 500 crores or 5000 crore for, for relief no that's a that's a that's a purely economic a, a financial demand at the end of that find 500 crores or 5000 crores have your problems disappeared no but it is much easier to take up things like this rather than to work the hard way i like particularly what ashok was saying a little while ago about the need to develop a taste the need to develop a a, a system in which something handmade is valuable it's sexy it's something that people will be willing to pay for they'll be willing to do something for it it gives you a kind of a cachet when you're wearing something that is handmade when you sport in your house ornaments and ujeda that are handmade if it, if that is something that is fashionable that is something that is in demand then we have got this 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 thing linked the thing is to start that and to start that you need revolutionaries you need radical people you need people whom you had mentioned earlier who who made a difference the first two that we spoke about everyone has spoken about them pubal jaikar and uh, kamala devi what did they do what they really did was to make handlooms and handicrafts available and in demand even to urban areas in india it's not only a broad that they did it but till that time especially in the handloom sector the british had finished it there were no handloom there was very little handloom cloth at all they would take the cotton from india weave it into yarn in manchester make it into cloth and then dump that on india no handloom cloth at all so it was this that the two revolution the two visionaries did at that time and i think they did that brilliantly but you needed a political will for sure. them to for, the, for that sure. kind of an impact you sure. see and the, the visionaries and the revolutionaries will bring that about i agree with you it needs political will ragu um yeah uh, the next question also is from uh, mayank and i think this is for bic Uh, and as sadna is that why isn't there a crafts person on this panel today so we are uh, uh, i think we can make the announcement that uh, we are going to do a follow up session with value of handmade this was on policy craft there's going to be a second session and we are in talks with uh, uh, people from bangalore yeah thanks uh, sadna uh, this question is from uh, lakshmi mishakha Uh, uh about public private uh, uh uh partnerships you know and how can we in this new scenario uh, think about uh, think about this you know is as can government enable that kind of partnership any more or uh, should it be left to the market entirely who would like to take that if i can uh, say and maybe sort of wrap it up with a short answer to mayank's thing also about policy well i think the whole thing is that for many many years the craft sector has been looked at as schemes rather than policies because policy in itself implies a long term strategy and every government that comes in wants to do something very fast and have something visible to show that we have distributed so much money or we have done x or y i think there has to be a will and a vision to take the sector seriously 
and until the sector itself, which is so diverse, acquires a voice of its own and can make demands on whoever the sitting government happens to be and saying that, you know, we need to go beyond these short term schemes. We need to go beyond following something which has been done over the years and we want something dramatic. It's not going to happen. And unfortunately, the sector has not organized itself. And as Mayan quite rightly said, we very seldom hear their voices. And now this one official forum has also gone. So I think that we need a national strategy on class which goes over and above, you know, governments themselves or bureaucrats, because bureaucrats also tend to move out of their seats with great speed and go from craft to power or water or some education. So there's no continuum at all. And unless you have that, you really can't make a dent. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Yeah. Uh, this is a question from Prasad Bidapa. Um, why should uh, artisanal work be affordable? Why are we reluctant to pay the, uh, pay the true value of handwork? Uh, because not a single designer in India is affordable. So why should artisans be expected to lower their prices? Ashok, Professor Chatterjee? Uh, who's asking the artisans to lower their prices? I don't think any of us would want to see that. We would like to have the artisan get as good a price as they possibly can. Uh, but in marketing terms, and Mr. Pindo touched on this without using the term, you have to do market segmentation. The high-end craft may very well be where much of the investment is needed. And maybe with the kind of uh, exits that are taking place from the sector, you will find uh, the great importance of building up the high-end market. But that does not mean that we should neglect what you've just heard from Archana, the kind of situation in Orissa, which is hugely empowering and economically powerful in terms of the artisan's well-being. So we, the, there's no one market for Indian craft. There are many markets, many Indias, where it's, you would never have this kind of a discussion if you were talking about machine-made products. You wouldn't say, we should only be doing expensive machine machine made products. Why? Well, you might be building uh, aircraft. You might also be building, making ball pens. We're in the same kind of situation. It's a very diverse sector. It can serve the consumer in a hundred ways. Some of those will be high end. And I certainly agree that we should concentrate on that because that's where investment is needed. But also at the lower end and also at the middle end. And just now, at the moment, since you've raised this issue, the whole question is, after COVID, what is going to happen? And those who understand markets are telling us that post-COVID, the market will be for value for money. Affordable, however affordable is defined, affordable products, functional products for the home and for the workplace. That is what we are told we should now concentrate on. Because when the market reopens, as I hope we all hope it does, people will have less spending power in their pockets. And we have to be prepared for that. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, this is a question from uh, Nandini Misra. Uh, how important, in your opinion, is craft research and documentation by private entities with, regard, with regards to its influence on policy? I think it's huge because certainly nobody else is doing it. So it has to be done by private individuals and documentation, whether it is of data or whether it is of design and motive is actually the basis for any development work. You can't do it, whether you're a designer or you're a statistician or you're a government analyst in the sector, economic analyst, without documentation and without data, you cannot proceed. And it's been the great, great weakness of our sector that we don't have that in place. Uh, thank you, Laila. Um, I think the next question is, uh, Jayanti uh, Krishnamachari asks, 
um, about you know uh, schools and colleges and making uh, handcraft uh, hand uh, you know handlooms and handcrafts uh, popular uh, and perhaps maybe you, you would like to comment on its link to the new NEP. Yeah. Uh, you may be aware that the uh, there's an excellent curriculum which has been developed by the uh, the uh, by the government for including crafts in school education. The challenge has been that very school, few schools are using it, largely because they cannot find the teachers who are trained to use that curriculum. So there is a challenge here. Uh, one of the interesting things that has happened during the COVID crisis and the lockdown that has come on schools is how many requests we have received from the schools to be able to bring crafts into online education. So there's an opportunity there. It doesn't, of course, end with schools, but the school that, since you brought this up, this is very important because it's the future generations who have to be sensitive. They are going to be the, the patrons for crafts tomorrow, and we need to do this. Uh, there have been various at, uh, attempts at uh, reaching out to schools, not on the scale that should be, and one of the reasons that is, appallingly, that in many institutions of higher education, as well as in schools, artisans are considered unqualified. So that they don't enter the education space with the kind of dignity and respect that they should have. And this is extremely important because if schools took an interest in craft, a whole scenario would open in every corner of this country, wherever schools are there. And I think you've raised a very interesting question. It's not just curriculum, it's not just teacher training, it's also respect for the artisan and for knowing that they are the greatest teachers we have in this country. Raghu, if I may add, yeah. Yeah. sorry, yeah. Arjuna, if you want to go ahead. Do we have time? I can, yeah. I'd like to give one small example in, of Sevagram. You know, the, the Sevagram has initiated this program of all municipal schools in that vicinity. Everybody spins, all the children spin for half an hour every day during their um, morning um, prayer meeting or the assembly time, post assembly time. What it has done is it has calmed minds, but what the kids do when they spin this yarn is taken at the end of the semester to Sevagram where they are shown the process of how fabric is made and they see that all the yarn they have they manage to just make one handkerchief so what what it does is it develops a huge um, respect for 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 anything that is handmade you know this will stay for for life and um, and I think initiatives of this kind of actually people being introduced to the value of, of hand skills or the value for handcrafted textiles would take us a long way. And, and I feel that initiatives of this kind need to be repeated all because it has made a tremendous difference. And the children are also make things from, from, the, from, the, um, uh, from the yarn they spin. They make wicks for their parents during Diwali they, you know, so I think it, it, it just adds so many layers of learning of, you know, through this experience. So if and I may add, you need to be repeated. I beg your pardon. Sorry. Yeah, Sadhan, go ahead. So if I may add, every year in December and in the summer, SPICMA cave, uh, Society for Promotion of Indian Classical Music and Culture Amongst You, has extended its uh, umbrella they have a conven international convention for college students ranging from 14 to 19. And in December, it's for school children. One of the IITs, IMs, gives Spick McKay place for about 10 days. And there are craft intensives which, uh, we have with, which, are, which are conducted with the master craftsmen. The students get to spend 8 to 10 days, 5 hours a day with the craftsmen. And at the end of the eighth or ninth day, they actually showcase, they produce a bit like what Archana said. This has been going on for the last 30 years. 
And the crafts intensive, when it started off when I was a student, were like eight or nine. And as actually today, the last convention that we've held has gone up to 44. So I think that uh, uh, to integrate curriculum and crafts, I think the movement has started. As the anthem goes, we have to soldier on. Just one little point to add to that. I do wish, I think it's a splendid idea. I do wish that more and more schools would take their children when they go on these trips, on these uh, 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 expeditions that they have to make compulsorily, to arts and crafts centers. For instance, you go to Aurangabad and you go and see the caves and this and that. But do you ever see the Pythony weaving there? The complicated nature of Pythony weaving, the length of time it takes to make a sari. When you go to Orissa, do you see the, the way Ikat is woven there? That as some, I, I think it was Laila who said this, that it's more complicated than many software engineers would want to do. So this is the kind of thing that we need to expose people to. I don't think everyone will be able to spend eight or 10 days doing it, but at least get some idea of how complicated, how difficult, and how tiring it is to work at crafts and how little reward there, reward there is. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. I'm afraid we're out of time and education is a good note to close on. Uh, Sadhna, over to you. Thank you for being a vibrant panel. Thank you. Thank you.